First Timothy. All right. About what period of time was First Timothy written? You remember? A long time ago. Cindy, do you remember what date it was? It was A.D., wasn't it? It wasn't before Christ. All right. Do you, do you, do you, Oh, Paul died in 67. Okay, Paul wrote the letter to Timothy. All right. Remember when Paul was uh, born? When was Paul born? Do you remember? 5 A.D. and he died? 67 A.D. <clears throat> what about Timothy? He was born in 17 A.D. And he lived a long, long time. <clears throat> he, born, he, was, he died in... In 97 A.D., he was about 79 or 80 years old when he died. Now, where was Paul born? Where? Tarsus. Tarsus. Okay, what about Tarsus? You remember, Penny? How about Tar Tarsus? You remember anything about that city? Hmm? Uh, it was a Roman city. Uh, of course, it was in Turkey or Armenia. What? It was a free city. Oh, you got an A-plus for that one. Free city. And what do they mean by free city, Dave? Do you know? A free they city. Pay taxes. They didn't have to pay taxes. They were basically no. free. They were citizens. They, they were free. citizens. It was an ecclesia, wasn't it? That old Greek word. An ecclesia. And that city itself did what? If there were any taxes to be taken, they did it. And then they gave it to the Roman Empire of their own volition. Okay, so this was a free city, very unusual. Paul was from a free city. He was born, he had Roman citizenship from birth. That's why he was beheaded instead of crucified when they finally, when Nero finally called for his death. Now let's go to Timotheus. Timotheus, what does Timotheus mean? Timotheus comes from Tim Timeo, which means what? Honorable, and what about the rest of his name? Timotheos. Come on, do some good guessing. What? Theos. Timotheos. Honor to God. Or honorable to God. That's what Timotheus means. Honorable to God. All right. <clears throat> now, Timothy had gone on Paul with us in several uh, missionary trips. Paul sent him to Ephesus, didn't he? All right. Ephesus, what does Ephesus mean? Ephesus. Come on, girls and boys. Ephesus. Relaxed. Okay, relaxed. That was one of the seven churches of Asia that, that, that John wrote the, churches, or the church letters to. And those seven churches of Asia, now this is off the subject, but what do those seven churches of Asia mean in the book of Revelation? What do they what do they mean? Yes. The different church ages. The periods of time and the church ages. They cover the whole church age that we live in. And what was the last church? And what did it mean? The last church. Come on. What? Laodicea. Laodicea. And what does Laodicea come from? Laos and Dikeo. All right. What does that mean? Remember that one? They did what was right in their own judgment. That's exactly the age that we live in today. Churches are doing what they think is right. They're changing lots of rules today, okay? Because it's the age we live in. That's what God said was going to happen, all right? There are true New Testament churches in the church age, but they're doing things their way. Paul gave some instructions to Timothy when he was in Ephesus and and the book of first Timothy and second Timothy and Titus basically tell us what how to what how to behave in God's churches how to behave in the church of God which is a pillar and ground of the truth so now we're up to this Paul is uh, by the way how old is Timothy here about this period of time. Just think about how old he is. How old is Timothy? He must have looked young for his age. 
How old was Timothy here? He was born in, uh, in 17 AD, and, and this is in uh, 64 AD, so how old is he? Huh? 47. 47, yeah. 40-something years old. So he's not a youngster, is he? But he's not exactly an elder either. But he is an elder, isn't he? Tell me the term presby presbyteros. Or presbyteros. What does this presbytery mean? What does presbytery mean? Presbyteros. What does presbyteros mean? Do you know what that one means, uh, Sharon? Cindy? How about it there, uh, Cindy? It means elder. It means an ordained elder in many places, one that has been ordained. <clears throat> in other words, there was a there was a church meeting. They were ordained, and then there was a charge given by one of the elders that was elected to preach. Usually, this and Baptist churches used to do that. If you want to hear an old time. Uh, ordination service you can go listen to my ordination service at, on sermon audio it's there and the preacher did a wonderful job preaching that ordination service and he talks about that and they all always even to this day they come by the elders all come by not the whole church members but all the elders that are in the presbytery that ordain this person what they do is they ask them questions and then they uh, uh, they give them you know they answer and, and if they consider that this person is uh, qualified to be an elder to be an elder then they vote to do it and then the church ordains them and Timothy was sent to Ephesus to do that now a long time ago there was a guy by the name of Patrick they went to Ireland and he went into Ireland and started preaching over there. He had been a, a captive for a long time there for, for several years. He escaped. He went back to Britain. Britain was a stronghold of Baptist churches, and Britain and Wales were a stronghold of Baptist churches at that time. And, <clears throat> and the church there where Patrick's father was a deacon, he told them that he wanted to go back to Ireland because God had put upon his heart that he wanted to go be a missionary and, and found churches. That's what missionaries do is they build churches. So Patrick went to Ireland, and you know what he did? He preached. He preached and he preached and he preached. He baptized over 100,000 people by his own hands. And he established 365 churches and thousands of elders and deacons and preachers. Now a preacher is an episcopos. Now in many many circles, in religious circles, a bishop is somebody that's high. But in all reality in the Bible there is no thing higher than a bishop because a bishop is a pastor. Simply a, a pastor. And, it, and the name episcopos comes from the word bishop or episcopos. What does episcopos mean? Episcopos is an elder. What does Episcopos mean? Episcope. Come on there, David. Episcopos. Shepherd? What? Shepherd? Epi means what? Page 153 and 154 in that book. Okay, that one right there. <laughs> I'm not kidding. 153 and 154. <clears throat> 153 and 154 it means what? Can't read. A pawn. <laughs> oh, you can't read that? Oh, you don't have your glasses on. All right. I don't blame you one bit for not being able to read it. Look, you can't see it. It says a pawn. Now, what does episcope mean? Episcopos. To look upon or to watch over scope for your rifle for your pistol scopes okay scope is something you look through okay episcopos is, is you watch over the flock of God now there are two kinds of ordained offices in a church what are they one's the bishop now some churches ordain elders which really 
they try to make that a ruling body. What's it's what's called Presbyterian rule. In other words, the presbytery rules the church. The church is according to the book of Timothy now, we're going to find out our congregational rule. They tell the bishops and the deacons what to do, basically. And they ordain them. And they call preachers and all of this. What is the other, besides an episcopos, what other, what other elder is there in God's churches? Deacons, diaconia. What does diaconia mean? Servant. What? Servant? Well, it's a servant, all right. Yeah, it means to stir up dust. To stir up dust. It means to do something. Get out there and work. Deacons are the people in the, in the church. Usually a deacon is supposed to be an example of people working around the church. <clears throat> working. Going and visiting the elders, elder, other elderly people in the church, and widows and orphans, and helping these people. You have to realize when this book was written, how many churches were there? How many church houses were there? None. None. They met in people's houses. But a deacon could go in and help a woman clean the house up, clean the yard up, or go out in the country and level a ground where people could sit down under some shade tree or clean out a cave where they could meet in a cave. If it was hot like today, it would be nice to be in a cave, 105 degrees. And in the shade when you don't have any. Deacons and uh, elder or preachers or episcopos are the two offices of the churches. Okay? Now, Paul told Timothy to go and ordain elders. Ordain elders. Now, when Patrick went to Ireland, the Catholic Church got wind of it later on and they forbid him to, 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 to establish churches and ordain elders and deacons and he told them to jump in the creek I don't need you to tell me what I can do and what I can't do now later on they kind of swiped him from the Baptists and made a saint out of him didn't they because he was pretty famous because he established all these churches but he never was a he never was a Catholic he hadn't, didn't have anything to do with the Catholic Church he didn't teach anything that the Catholic Church teaches during his period of time one in verse four. One and four. May day. Pros ekane. Mythois. Kai. Genial genealogias. Aperontois. Hytenes. Exateses. Para ecusen. Malon. A, oikonomion, theu, tain, and piste. <coughs> I asthma is bothering me. <coughs> May day comes from May and day. May is a particle affirmation, and day is what? We could act we could verse the conjunctive particle. So here we have something that says, uh, moreover not, or neither. Prosecane. Don't grab a hold of. Don't grab on to, is what he said. Don't latch on to. Don't catch like somebody's throwing a ball to you. Don't catch this ball. <coughs> Don't catch the ball. Don't grab forward. To mythois. Mythois. What is mythois? Myths. All right, don't worry about myths. There were myths already going around at this period of time, by the way. There was already myths. Myths are, this is what we get a word, mythology. Uh, the word mythology means the study of myths. What is a myth? Tell me a myth. A story. A legend. <coughs> there are many legends. Um. A few years ago, in 1995, as a matter of fact, how many of you heard of the legend of Jesse James? Hmm? The what, the uh, History Channel came out with a, a documentary on Jesse James, and uh, 
Later on, it was found out that that documentary was mythology. They used DNA, and they said that they dug up Jesse James' grave, supposedly where he was buried, and they said 97, 99.7%, that is Jesse James in there. But what the DNA report said is it was not him. It was not him. But because they had a agenda, they just looked over that and said, that's him, that's the end of the story. But it was lies. It was a myth. There's a lot of myths about him. There were three major characters of Jesse James. Three major characters. They were all related. The guy that was killed, and they looked at uh, <clears throat> they looked at the reports, the coroner the coroner's report. Bob Ford said he shot Jesse James with a Smith and Wesson 4440 pistol. 4440 is pretty powerful. That's what I was shooting out at range the other day was 4440. And he said that he shot Jesse James when he was up there. He took his guns off and everything else. And he was getting up to straighten out a picture and he shot him through the back of the head. He came out the front of the head and he said blood was squirting four inches out of his forehead when he hit the ground and dying. And he ran off. And the bullet stuck in the wall. Well, the coroner's report said <laughs> that that body was there already had a rig of mortise in it and it was shot with a 36 caliber ball from a Kaplan ball pistol. That's a lot different than a 44, 40, isn't it? And the bullet was still in his head. And he had been beat up real bad before <clears throat> this happened. One of them he thought he had been hit in the head with the butt of a pistol. That was in the coroner's report which was hidden. This is mythology. But that was a real report. Well, that never got to the press. It was stopped before it ever got there. There's a lot of stories about it. A lot of mythology and a lot of stories about it. But the truth was he didn't get killed there. He lived for many years later. He had an agenda. He had enough money to, to do an elaborate scene of his death. And the guy that was killed was per per portraying himself as Jesse James and Robin Banks when Jesse James wanted to, to uh, fade into the sunset. So he said, this is a good deal. Let's get him. <laughs> and Marilyn's uncle was probably the one that shot him and beat him up. His name was Jim Reed. <laughs> Read a little bit of history about that. This is, this is facts compared to mythology. Mythology sometimes will really walk when the facts are inconvenient. Mythology. And Genealogies. <clears throat> Genealogies. Now, the Jews would always tell, spend a lot of time telling you who they were and everything else. Now, in the Bible, we have two genealogies. We have Matthew, which is uh, Jesus' genealogy through Joseph. We have Luke, with Jesus' genealogy through Mary. These are genealogies. Why are they written there? to establish who he was. Now the Jews, <laughs> this is the Messiah, and these people would come through. The, this, this is who the Messiah would come through. Unending, with no end. Never reaching an end. It means from the end. Which is questionings. Seek out. Chasing rabbits. Okay. Chasing rabbits. What is the Mishnah? And what is the Talmud? The Mishnah and the Talmud. What is it? What? It is uh, commentaries on the Old Testament. Now the Old Testament is very small. But these commentaries, I think I got 28 or 30 volumes of the, the what we call the Babylonian Talmud. We got a great big thick book on the Mishnah. These are what is called the traditions. The traditions. Now, in those traditions, you're going to see all types of mythology. Tremendous amount of mythology. Unending questionings. They provide, they beside have, as Para and Akusin, okay, rather than stewardship. Look at those words, oikonomion. 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 What does that mean? Oikos nomion. 
What does that mean? How about oikos? Oikos. What? That's your, your inner circle of influence. What, what's that? Your circle of influence. It's what? Your circle of influence. Oikos means house. Oh. House. Okay? House. House stewardship. What about the English word steward? What does that mean, steward? Stewardship. Stewardship. What does the word steward mean? What does it come from? Tell me. It comes from two words, sty and ward. The guy took care of the pigs. Huh? He took care of the pigs. The guy that took care of the prince's livestock. Sty is a pen, and ward is the guy that was taking care of it. The ward. This is his ward. Steward. That's what we had, an old English word. These are the administrators of the house of God. Okay? The administrators that have order over the house of God. The house, the administration of God, the in faith. In the faith. <coughs> in faith or in the faith. 1 and verse 5. To, de telos, tes parangelias, esten, Apage, agape, that is. I said that backwards. I tried to read it like Hebrew. <laughs> Ek, katharos, kardios, kai, sin adesios, agathos, agathes, kai, bestios, on hypocritu. Excuse my asthma. <laughs> but the end, but the telos, telos means end. Terminal island, that means relating to the end, doesn't it? Terminal. Relating to the end. Terminal illness, that's something that's going to come to an end, usually at the end of the person's life. Fallen bacteria and viruses that kill the host, that that uh, support them, like Satan. God created him, and he fought Satan, the very person. Uh, God created him, and Satan fought God, the very person that created him and created everything. He fought him, trying to be God. We have so many people out there, and people out there in false religious systems that start these religions. God started one church and man, men has started hundreds of churches. But the end of the charge, parangelios, what does that parangelios mean? Let's break her down. Para on the front of it is what? Beside. That means beside and then angelios. Angelios. We got a word in English from that word. Angel. Angel. So this is a beside message. This is a charge. Para intensifies the message. The charge, it is. Now remember I told you they used to ordain elders and then someone would get up there and, and give the charge. That's basically what Paul's doing. He's giving the charge. When I was uh, ordained, I had a charge. And I was very young. I was in my 20s when I was ordained. Early 20s. And they charged, they gave me a charge, a, uh, uh, an indictment to do this. This is what you do. All right? The charge, it is love out of clean heart. Love out of clean heart. What is that word agape there? Do you remember what that word agape means? What kind of love is this? Sacrificial love. This is sacrificial love, something you give your life for. Out of katharos, katharos. What English name comes out of this? Kathy. Kathy or Kathleen or Catherine. All come from this word, which means clean. Clean persons. A lot of women named Kathy don't live up to that name, do they? Clean. Clean hearts. Clean hearts. Uh, <clears throat> what do you say? I mean it from the bottom of my heart. 
The Greeks also used to say, I believe it, believe it from the bottom of my liver. <laughs> or my guts. A clean heart. Clean heart. What's that mean? Heart means ambition. It means a, a reason or an ambition. Why do you do something? What's the incentive? From a clean incentive, okay? And... All right. You have to put ek here also because it's tied together out of a clean heart and out of a sin a dacios. That means uh, to know together, which means conscience, knowledge. Out of a clean heart and clean knowledge. Out of clean heart and clean knowledge. <coughs> and then we have another word here, a little... Uh, descriptive word, little adjective describing what kind of conscience. It's agathes, agathes. Now, <clears throat> it means good, doesn't it? There's another word for good in Greek that is the word kalos, kalos. Kalos means what? Just simply good. But what about agatho, agathos or agathes? This is spiritually good, all right? Out of a spiritually good conscience, Chi, a conjunction. Out of faith. Now, you have to put ek in front of every one of these words because it's tied together, and the Greeks aren't going to be too redundant because they, you're supposed to know that all of this sentence here has out of in it. Okay? We have this preposition, and it means out of. Out of a, out of a pure heart, out of a pure conscience, and out of faith. Out of faith. Pistios. Faith. What is faith? Give me a description of faith. Can you give me a scripture that uses the word faith and tell me where it comes from? Where does faith come from? There's a lot of faith healers today. People that say that you're you're healed by faith. Where does faith come from? From God. Can you prove that? It's in the book of Ephesians. That's a very, very good thing, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For in grace, it says from Greek, you are having been saved through faith. And that, not of yourself, not out of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are God's workmanship, created unto good works. Faith, faith. Faith is a gift of God. That's how you believe. What are the three gifts left in the world today? Three gifts left in the church today. What are the three gifts? Faith, hope, and love. Thank you. You got an A plus there. Faith, hope, and love. Okay. What will be the final gift that will carry the church through all eternity? Love. Love. El peace means uh, hope but it means a guaranteed future existence when we have and when we're with our Lord and sitting there at the table with him we won't have to hope that we're going to do this today we have faith that that's going to happen and that faith is God it comes from God, it's a gift of God now I believe the Bible is totally inspired of God I don't believe the King James Bible is inspired. I don't believe the New American Standard Bible is inspired. I don't believe that the Amplified Bible is inspired. But I believe that the original scriptures in Greek and Hebrew are inspired. Every tense, mode, and voice, and whatever. Every conjunction, particle, whatever is there by the inspiration of God. All the translations are not quite perfect. But in those original languages, you're dealing with a literally word, God-breathed word of God. And I trust that. And I have founded my faith upon that. Not even Baptist dogma. There are a lot of things in Baptist dogma I take very much, uh, I insult it. <laughs> Simple. When they start having all this dogma, I, I expose it. When I'm teaching church history, I expose the fallacies of things. Even if it's in my group. I expose the fallacy of it. The fallacies of what they've done in history. Mistakes. 
One thing Baptists haven't has have not done is ever persecute anybody else or try to break their neck or kill them or, or force them to believe what they believe. All other religions have done that. All other denominations have done that. Baptists haven't done that. That's one thing that's very beautiful and is scriptural. The Southern Baptists uh, fought hard on the, on the side of the South for states' rights because they wanted to uh, keep slavery because slavery was really a good economic uh, boon to them, they thought. People kept standing up and saying, slavery is not good. You can hire a man as an indentured servant. What president was an indentured servant? What president was a former slave? Andrew Johnson. What other great American leader was a former slave? Benjamin Franklin. He escaped. He was indentured. They, sometimes they could work it off, but they were slaves. They didn't own themselves for a while, 10, 15 years or whatever. And usually an indentured slave would work harder than any bought and paid for servant because they never looked forward to any future. Okay, no future. <clears throat> the Southern Baptists were on the South. They believed in slavery. When my teachers, when I was going to seminary, uh, many of them were segregationists, absolutely. That the blacks were created by God to be slaves. They believe that, even though the scriptures that they use, they did violence to the scriptures, trying to make them teach that. And I mean, they believed it. I saw that. I told you many times when I went to school, I took an entrance exam, but I was hurt before I started in seminary. I was crippled, literally. My back was destroyed. I was paralyzed for a while, and they operated on my back, and, and I got better. But uh, <clears throat> I went down there, and I had spent a lot of time. I got every book in the seminary, and I studied all those books before I ever went, and I took every extension course that I could. And when I went there, I took a, a, a entrance exam, and I scored so high that I had to take no remedial courses, not any Greek, not any Hebrew, nothing, no remedial courses, because I had credits, extension credits from these classes. I was in advanced reading and research. I didn't have to take any English. I took English etymology, and I became the, the first week I was the was the substitute teacher for all the classes I was taking here, I was in advance. The first year I was a freshman, the second one I was a junior. And when I took that entrance exam, the, uh, the registrar there was very prejudiced. And he looked at me and he said, uh, I don't believe this test you took. I believe it was wrong. There's a mistake somewhere. He said, what nationality are you? I said, I'm American Indian. And he said, no Indian ever scored a test like this make you take it over again. Another registrar was sitting there and he said no. He said he knows what he's doing. And I succeeded. <laughs> I had a lot to learn, but I was all in all advanced courses. All through my seminary career I didn't take any remedial courses because I already knew that. <clears throat> Faith. Faith. Faith is a gift of God. And then we have on hypocritu. On hypocritu. Tell me about this word. It's a it's a triple compound word, isn't it? Cindy, can you tell me one part of that word? Hippo. What? Hippo? Okay. What's another part of that word? Sharon? Right on the front of it. On. 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 Anna, on comes from Anna, hippo is, here we have two prepositions, all right. And then we have what? Crito. What's crito? It means to act. Hippocrito, the actor to make judgments. The Greek playwrights, or play, plays that were performed in front of audiences, a person would act one actor would play two or three parts and he would use a mask and he would get up there and he would act like this person, he'd change his voice, act like another person, change his voice, act like another person, he might act like a man or woman or child, but with a different mask. 
but he was memorizing all this and he's, he's acting it all out but what he is is a person that is a hypocrite a hypocrite it means an actor hypocrite means an actor now the Bible tells us don't be hypocrites Muhammad hated hypocrites According to Muhammad, uh, the people that he called hypocrites were people that, that feigned, that said that they believed in him. It said you had to believe in one God, only one God, Allah, and that Muhammad is his prophet. And <clears throat> once he left Mecca and went to Medina, he became a warrior. He changed. When he was in Mecca, he was a preacher, a prophet, so-called. When he went to uh, Medina he became a warrior and a politician and if you didn't follow him on any episode wherever he was going and kill people you were a hypocrite and he'd kill them and he'd get mad at this person that person he'd sit down and then it, a message came from God he'd start naming all these people off that didn't go one time he went back after they went a long way and, and they were going to attack the Byzantine Empire and he came back and all these guys had stayed back because it was in the middle of the summertime, hotter than blazes, probably 120 or 30 degrees. People died from uh, heat exhaustion on that. Their camels, their horses died because of this terrible, terrible thing. And he was so mad all the time he was just fuming all the time because they didn't follow him. When he got back he got a message from God and he started naming these people all. And there's about half a dozen of these people that he told nobody could speak to them because they were hypocrites. They wanted excuses why they didn't go. They were hypocrites. If you didn't fight jihad, you were a hypocrite. It's only about 40% of the Muslim world today that are not hypocrites. And ISIS is one of them that's not a hypocrite because they're acting exactly like Muhammad tell them to act. Those are the ones that are following his orders. The other ones are hypocrites. He would denounce them today. If they didn't kill and try to conquer the whole world, he said, my object on his deathbed, he said, don't let any two religions live anywhere. Kill in the name of Allah until they've all become one religion. Otherwise, you are a hypocrite. Now, in a Christian society, what is a hypocrite? That's what the Muslim world said was a hypocrite if you didn't kill people, if you didn't follow him to the nth degree, if you didn't, all of your whole, all of your money, all of your wealth was for jihad. That's the only thing. And the only way you're going to get directly into heaven is if you die in battle. All Muslims have to go to hell. Did you know that? They all have to go to hell. But those that die in jihad, they get to go to heaven and they get to take 70 people with them. They become what we call, uh, yes. I have a question. Yes. You know how they recruit these people and they get them to go out and they get them to be suicide bombers or whatever? The leaders are not the ones doing it. How do no. the leaders go to heaven? Because they're not, I mean, are they because they're the leaders they get to go? So we have a different set of rules or what? They are protected because they're leaders. Like Muhammad was protected. He, was, he always set back. A few battles he was out in the front, not very many. Most of the time he was had guards all around him. Uh, these are imams, and they were holy men. They're not. They're telling them what to do. How do they get the women to kill people when they have little children and everything in the house? How do they get them to go out and give their lives? First of all, many of those women have been accused of adultery, and they only have one way out and that's to cut their throats their own coats cut their wrist and die so they all that's what you call honor killings or honor suicides or now if you die you're still going to die with a black mark on your face because you were accused of being a hypocrite whether you were or not or unfaithful but and they give them a choice now you can go and tie bombs all over you you can go in and kill all these people and you will be a martyr and you can take 70 people to heaven with you. You're either going to be defamed and a, a disappointment forever or you can be a hero. So they say, well, that's what I'll do because they believe this. Okay? They believe it. 
There was one. There was one girl. One girl. This is a story. I could tell you the girl's name and everything else. I can't remember it right now. But uh, there was four brothers in her family, and the four brothers, when she got big enough, they started raping her, and she finally got pregnant. And uh, she was sexually abused. Well, her mother went out and bought razor blades and gave them to her and says, kill yourself and bring honor back to the family. Kill yourself and bring honor to the family or else go out and blow yourself up and kill somebody else and become a hero. She wouldn't do it. Her mother got a plastic bag, put it over her head, tied her hands up and slit her wrist and held her down until she quit breathing and died. Because she wouldn't bring honor to the family. It's what you call honor killing. One little boy, his father, <coughs> Shonim tells the story. He was there. He saw this. This man, uh, when they, I can't remember if it was Iraq or Afghanistan, they had a little seven-year-old boy. And when the Marines came in there, the Army people, when they came in, they said, where are the bad guys? And the little kid says, right over there. He didn't th know what he was doing. He was too young to know anything. His father took him in front of the council, in front of the tribe. He read the statement for honor killings. He put a rope around his neck, picked him up all that with a little kid saying, Daddy, 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 all the time, and broke his neck and killed him because he had dishonored his family. But he was seven years old, didn't know, come here from Sikkim, nothing. That's what, that's the that's it. Hypocrites. He was a hypocrite, see. In church, hypocrites are those people that make professions of faith and never, never, never live like they should. Never. They never serve the Lord. Why? Because they really didn't ever know the Lord. This is what we call hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. People go to church sometimes for... Uh, Social. You know what? People used to go to church. You know, atheists went to church one time. People didn't even believe in God. They went to church before radio and before television because they wanted entertainment. They listened to singing. They watched the preacher get up there and preach. And some of those backwoods Baptist churches, the preacher preached one time a month and preached the same sermon for ten years. That's right. Never preached. That's all he had. One message. How would you like to listen to that? That'd take faith, wouldn't it? <laughs> and endurance, hippo monet. Unfeigned, unacting, without hypocrisy. Number six, one six. <clears throat> un, un, tenes, asto, que santes. Ex terra peson, ace. My Tiologia. <coughs> From which some, and here we have the word that is so misunderstood in theological circles today because of one man that put the wrong word in a lexicon and the man's name was Thayer. How many of you ever heard of Thayer's Greek English lexicon? Mr. Thayer mistranslated from Hebrew into, in into Greek a word. Uh, Romans 3.23 tells you about the two words, both of them. How many times have you heard a preacher say, hamartia means what? To miss the mark. Because Thayer said that. Does hamartia mean to miss the mark? No. It means to go astray. This word right here, astoke santes, means to miss the mark. And it comes from the Hebrew word chatha, which Thayer translated, which means to miss the mark in Hebrew. But in English, here is the word, the equivalent to it. It is not hamartia. Hamartia comes from a and merio, which means to go astray. It means a river that breaks its banks and floods and that does damage. It means to go out of the pathway. This word means to miss the mark. I fell for that too. 
for a long time. Probably 15 years of my life, I preached that hamartia met to Mr. Mark, and I sat down one day and I said, you know what? I got all these Greek lexicons. Now this is what my teacher said, and this is what this guy said, and I heard these guys say this all the time. Well, I'm going to find out what hamartia means. I'm going to chase it down so I can say it's on this page in the book. You know what I found out? It didn't mean to Mr. Mark at all. <coughs> I was so surprised. So surprised. It didn't mean to Mr. Mark. Hamartia mean to Mr. Mark is mythology. It doesn't mean to Mr. Mark. It means to go astray. It means to break the boundaries, to go out of bounds. Here, this word means to Mr. Mark. Astoke santes. It comes from astokio. Page 57 in the analytical Greek lexicon. All right? To miss the straight line, to miss the mark, from chatha in Hebrew. It comes from a and stokos. <coughs> and some, having missed the mark, they were turned out. They were turned out. Matthew, the 18th chapter, talks about church discipline. People in early churches, if you didn't live, if you didn't walk the walk and talk, you could talk the talk, but if you didn't walk the walk, you got turned out. There was a guy there in Corinthians, in the first Corinthian letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, and he told them, there is a church member that you have there that is having sex with his own mother and living with his mother like his wife. Turn him out. And they kicked him out of the church. Matthew 18th chapter says, "Whatever you bind in heaven will already be, uh, whatever you bind on earth will already be bound in heaven." This is church authority. The church is the administrator, oikonomia, in this kingdom of God today. Every one of those people, all the way from Adam this way, they had an administration in God's kingdom. And Jesus told the church that was in existence right there. He said, if you have somebody that does this, how many times are you supposed to forgive them, by the way? Seventy times. But if they're hypocrites, turn them out, that they will be shamed by the church. That guy got, got re repented. Now, evidently, he was a saved man. Can saved people do this stuff? Yeah. You're still living in a human body, a sinful human body. You can do all kinds of stuff. You can. But I'll tell you one thing about a lost person. A lost person can do all kinds of bad stuff and get by with it. A saved person, if you do all those bad things, you know what's going to happen to you? Better duck. Huh? Better duck. You better duck a lot. Both directions and from every way. Right, left, top, and bottom. Really good. <laughs> you better duck. There was a man by the name of uh, Van Johnson about three or four hundred years ago. I can't remember exactly the time. He wrote a little saying, A man may sin securely, but safely never. A man may sin securely. A safe man may sin securely. In other words, he's not going to go to hell, but never safely. You better duck. You better dodge, because the Lord's going to get you. If you're God, you can't live like that. And the church is just putting those people out so they'll be ashamed because they can't be in fellowship with God's people and live like this. They can't do this. Okay? He said some were turned out. They're turned out. Some of the church members are turned out. Now in 2 Corinthians, Paul wrote that church back a letter again and told them that guy had repented and let him come back to your church. Don't just keep on being mean to him now fellowship him back into the church. He straightened out. <coughs> this happens. You always pray for those you don't now, there are there are churches that just literally love to exclude people from them. One of them is a false religion and it's absolutely just they absolutely humiliate and just mistreat their what we call dislocated church members and that's Jehovah Witnesses 
They humiliate them. They can go to the service, but they have to sit alone. They have to leave before everybody else does. They have to do all this kind of stuff because they're supposed to. Sh I know that I'm bad, and you got to be humiliated like this all the time. You got to show this humiliation because you're being bad. And another bunch that are true churches is missionary Baptists. When they have association meetings and all of their minutes and everything for the year, they put down how many people they gladly excluded from their churches for whatever reason. They want some other church and listen to a preacher preach, excluding them for spiritual fornication. Like a cult. Like a cult. Like Jehovah's Witnesses. Galileo was excluded from the Catholic Church, wasn't he? Because he said what? What we He said the earth was round. They said, take it back, take it back, take it back. That's not the, the opinion of the church. The earth's flat. Not as bad as Muhammad. He has one egg-shaped earth and, and, and six other ones that are flat, wherever they are. But... Galileo, they threatened him with death. They ex excommunication and death. Manipulation. When a church does that, something wrong somewhere. When you state a fact. Have you ever heard of the ice and the no ice Baptist? Anybody? You do. You did. You took all my church history classes. The ice and the no ice Baptist. You know what that means? The ice and the no ice Baptists? Missionary Baptists one time. It's missionary Southern Missionary Baptist, Orthodox Southern Missionary Baptist. There was a group of them back there that lived out in the hills, way out in the hills. And one of the young people in the church happened to go to a city. He went down to the city, and they had railroads. And he went, and he saw an ice house where they made ice. Well, they made ice. Now, how many of you have ever seen an ice house? I have. We used to go down there when I was a little kid, and uh, down on Kentucky Street in Bakersfield, down there was an ice house where they would load this, the railroad cars with these blocks of ice come out of this ice house they had there, and they'd chop them up and put them on vegetables, meat, whatever, and, and that's, they didn't have refrigeration like they do today. That, we used ice. And we'd go down and pick up chunks of ice and put it in our ice box. Well, this boy went down there and he saw this taking place. He came back and he told the members of the church, I saw them making ice. And they said, that's got to be heresy. That's, you're a liar. They excluded him from the church. And those people that believed him were called the Ice Baptists. And those that didn't believe him, they split and made two churches and then the other ones were the No Ice Baptists. This is the truth, people. This isn't the story. This is what happened. <clears throat> All right. Number six. Missing the mark. They were turned out. Unto vain, aimless talk. Matologia. Matologia. And this... Uh, <clears throat> in late Koine, literary Koine, this turned out to be a salesman. A used car salesman, <laughs> used camel salesman, used donkey salesman, whatever. That's what it meant, a salesman. <clears throat> and a salesman will tell you anything, won't they? They'll tell you anything under the sun. You might have a wife as ugly as a mud fence, and you come in, oh, what a beautiful wife. What good children you have. And the children run around like a bunch of yard apes. They'll tell you everything you want to hear, and they say, what can I do? What do I have to do to put you into this car right here? And they won't turn loose of you until you tell them what you'll do. That they can sell you that car. Is what you call high pressure. That's the word right here. Later on in late coin A. Right now, it talks about uh, foolish talking, aimless talking, talking like a moron, literally. Like a moron. Talking like a nut. A moron. A lot of people live in this world that are religious morons, aren't they? That propagated empty, not truths. I've always told you, a lot of people today now, 
This is the King James only bunch. They'll say you don't study the Greek and Hebrew, it'll confuse you. Don't do that. Don't study Greek and Hebrew, it's going to confuse you. You'll get confused. I always tell people don't be afraid to study in Greek and Hebrew, it's going to make you a better theologian. It might even make you a Christian. I had one girl saved in my class, taking my Hebrew class. She realized she's lost. And I went back there and talked to her, and she got saved. People can get saved teaching church history. Vain, purposeful talk, non-purposeful talk. When you preach the word of God, you ought to preach the gospel. Salvation is by grace, isn't it? There's nothing you can do to get to heaven as simple as that. Some of these people were turned out because they were empty talkers. They were liars. Liars. <clears throat> We've seen this in church history, haven't we? Remember when Charles Says Russell went to uh, British Columbia? Canada? He went up there and told them that the, all the theologians up there were nothing but liars, that they didn't know anything about the Bible, that he was a Greek and Hebrew scholar, and that he was going to tell them, and the, the, the deity of Christ was a, it was a facade. And he went on, he said, I know Greek and Hebrew. Well, there was a, there was a pastor up there. I think he was a, I can't remember whether he was Presbyterian or Baptist, but he knew Greek and Hebrew. And he put in the newspaper, this guy is a fraud. He is no scholar. Does he ever tell you his credentials or anything like that? He is no scholar. He's a fraud. He's talking vain. He's talking through his hat. Well, it went to court. The court case went to court. And they were going to, Charles Sage Russell was going to sue the guy for defamation of character. And they uh, got up there and in the examination, this is history, history. During the examination, the preacher got up there, and he was defending himself, and he said, I'm going to ask you something, Mr. Russell. What degree of what college did you, do you have agreed from any seminary? He said, no. Okay. You know Greek and Hebrew? Oh, yes, I'm, I know Greek and Hebrew really well. <clears throat> talking to his hat. Vain talking, empty, lying, aimless. He said, okay, Mr. Russell, uh, if I get write a verse of Hebrew or Greek, can you read that verse for me? He said, well, I don't know. I'm pretty rusty about it. How about if I just put some words out here? Can you read them to me in Greek or Hebrew? So he writes them down on a piece of paper. He said, tell me what this is. He said, I don't know. I don't know what it means. Okay. How about if I write the Hebrew alphabet? Can you recite the Hebrew I've about and read it for me no how about the Greek alphabet no yet you know Greek and Hebrew you're a scholar oh yes but you don't know the alphabet you can't read any words out of the Bible you can't read one verse out of the Bible you can't read a chapter out of the Bible you can't tell me what book it is by reading Greek or Hebrew in the title and the judge, you know what the judge said? Case dismissed. He's a fraud. He's a fraud. He's this word right here. Nothing but a salesman. Nothing but a salesman. Joseph Smith was quite a salesman, wasn't he? Quite a salesman. Yeah. <clears throat> One and seven. Thelontes. Ain't a? No mo didasca loi. Me, nontes, mete, ha, lagusen, mete, peri, tenon, dia, be, ba, unte. Do you think I'd pass that test up there? <laughs> you want me to do that in Hebrew too? <laughs> wishing, nominee, plural, masculine, present participle acting, constantly wishing to be what? Mainly what he's talking about here is those people that, that are studying the Talmud and the Mishnah all the time. That's all they're doing. These are the lawyers. They want to be lawyers. They want to be teachers of the law. Not understanding. And this word comes from the word noose. 
Remember all the words for, for mind that I have? This is one of the words for mind right here. It means noose. Okay? <clears throat> Cindy ought to get you up here one of these days and let us let you describe energy times the what is it? Energy times the mass times the speed of light. Yeah. That's a beautiful, beautiful formula, and I know you know that. Ener energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Yeah. I had that written down in my Bible. <laughs> Don't be afraid to study science. Don't be afraid to study archaeology. None of these sciences. They don't disagree with the Bible. Not truth, doesn't. News. Faculties of perception and understanding, feeling, judging, determining, spiritual. Ephesians 4 and 12, Philippians 4 and 7, Colossians 2, 18, 1 Timothy 6 and 5, and 1 Timothy 1 and 7, 2 Timothy 3 and 8, Romans 7, 23, 2, 25. The word nome, nome, ability to discern the capacity of judgment as far as conduct is determined. <coughs> Boule, <coughs> Boule. The mental will or plan, counsel. Thelematos, spiritual actilating force or wishing, the volition. That's the word thelontes, okay? Word frain, this is horse sense. This is the, uh, to have enough sense to get in and out of the rain, okay? It's frame, the discipline, the midriff, the mind, intellect, carnal intellect. And then word Sophia, which is what? Wisdom, spiritual wisdom, Sophia. So you get to look at that just a little bit. Here we have the word noose. Spiritual understanding. <coughs> Either what things they say, nor concerning what things they emphatically charge or assert or speak none of these they don't understand this they have no spiritual understanding they're just talking through their hat so to speak these people don't know the basic object God a lot of people want to study about God God Timotheus means what? Timotheus Timeo means what? Honorable. And then Theos, God. Be honorable to God. Many teachers are not honorable to God. They propagate themselves instead of God. They pro propagate themselves. Charles says Russell, Joseph Smith, Mary Ellen White, just name them all the way down to here. They have another plan of salvation, don't they? Every one of them had a different plan of salvation. Mohammed had a different plan of salvation, didn't he? All different plan of salvation. But what is basic theology? What does basic theology say? Can you get to heaven on your own works? No. What do you mean? What do you need? You need an intercessor. And who became that intercessor? God himself in the flesh of Jesus Christ, which we call the incarnation. But did we have a pre-incarnate Christ in the Old Testament? Before the act of becoming flesh? Yes, we did. And all the Old Testament does what? It points us to the person of Jesus Christ. We need a Savior. <coughs> We're saved by grace, by grace alone, not anything else we do. We can't come to God by ourselves. How many of you came to God? You come to God by what? The wooing of the Holy Spirit of God. <coughs> You're saved by grace. <coughs> that's it any religion <coughs> that circumvents the person of God Jesus Christ as a savior of the world the only savior of the world <coughs> Muhammad said of course he contradicted himself many many times but Muhammad said that no man could be an intercessor that every man is born into the world free of sin that's not what the Bible teaches is it the Bible teaches that every man is born in sin 
<coughs> and the Bible says that we need an intercessor, which is that, well, there's one intercessor between man and God, which is the person Christ Jesus, which is what? The Savior of the world. <coughs> Muhammad said there's no intercessor between man and God you have to you have to do all of these things you have to fast during the, the month of Ramadan except are they fasting are they fasting no what are they doing they're just changing their time of eating they eat after dark instead of the daytime they're eating just as much but they're eating after dark that's not fasting fasting is when you go without food period for 30 days. They have to fast for that whole month. <clears throat> now, you have to do that. You have to make a hajj. You have to go over there and run around that uh, uh, kava seven times and then kiss that stone or put your hand on that stone because that is the hand of God of all. Okay? And that, that stone will absorb all of your sins. The Bible says, for by grace you save through faith and not, not of yourself. The calling is not of you, nothing. You can't call yourself to God. You can't do anything. It's all by grace. So that's, I mean, it's really idolatry. Yeah, it is. Idolatry. Anything else is idolatry. Muhammad said that uh, there are no intercessors between man and God and Allah. Yet, he says, that every Muslim martyr is an intercessor for 70. And when they say the word Muhammad, they always say what? Peace be upon him. And that is a prayer to God asking for Muhammad to be their intercessor. It's not making sense, is it? It's not making, it's not logical now. Is there an intercessor or not? They said every man, his, his, his deeds will be weighed. <clears throat> and if his deeds outweigh his bad his good deeds outweigh his bad deeds he gets the gold but he has to go to hell first all Muslims have to go to hell and they go through this cleansing period now when you're Catholic you have to go to what purgatory which is a temporary hell and the Bible says if you're born again you go straight to be with God to be beatific vision right into paradise but if you're lost you go straight to hell and stay that way, don't you? That's it. That's the story of the Bible. And the Bible says no man can save himself. The Jews, they had Pharisees. The Pharisees figured out a whole lot more rules than the Bible did. They were teachers of the law. That's what we're talking about here. Teachers of the law. Well, thank you for your attention tonight. We went to 1-4 through what? Through seven. <clears throat> Do you have a question? No questions? Sharon, you don't have a question? Penny, you got a question? All right. Well, let's be dismissed in prayer. Go out and do something eternal. You've got a little bit of more license to teach now than what you had before, don't you? You learned a little bit tonight, I think. Learned a little bit of grammar and a lot of uh, scripture. Yes. So in this, this church body here at Valley, do they kick people out? Yes. Like Some people are excluded. Well, for whatever terrible sins that the Bible says. Uh, whatever the sins in Corinthians is sin here uh, they they don't do it exactly like the Bible says because we're changed things a little bit yes Cindy. isn't it like the, what I understand is they kick you out for things that you're not you're doing something repeatedly over and over again and you're not remorseful for those for that and yes need to see a change they will usually come they will it, it's it's with the pastors and the deacons now, in a regular Baptist church, they will bring up charges against the person. Usually the person isn't there because he's just gone doing what he wants to. I've seen them do it, I mean, in church. Uh, <clears throat> little, one little example. In this one Baptist church, this guy went to Las Vegas. 
when you go to Las Vegas, you're putting yourself into a lot of temptation anyway. But he went to Las Vegas, and he went down there, and he had dinner, and they had drinks with their dinner. And so they, uh, they come to church the very next week. They found out about this. And they, uh, they, they brought charges against the man and his wife. And, uh, and he said, I'm sorry, and all this kind of stuff. And then they stood up, and they said, how many drinks did you have? And what did you drink? And what did you do? Did you gamble and all that kind of... He said, I said, I'm sorry. But they wanted to rake them over the coals. Now, churches do that sometimes. That's real bad about these churches. I'm talking about the Missionary Baptist churches. They love exclusion. They're more happy when they exclude somebody than when they baptize somebody, and they have a lot more exclusion than they do baptism, by the way. <laughs> Believe it or not. But here, if somebody's doing something wrong and they know about it, they talk to you, see if you're going to straighten up or what are you going to do. Do you want to make, remain to be a member of this church? Do you want to come here or not or what? And they just do it and they don't make a public scene out of it. And those churches, boy, I mean, they're really working you over. Most Baptist churches, when you, <clears throat> and I, I, I love going to those old time Baptist churches. I want to, uh, the Fairfax Southern Baptist Church, I preached there a lot. And when I'd preach there, somebody would get saved, and they'd go before the church, and they'd get saved, and somebody would do something wrong. Uh, one time I went there, and this girl came forward and saved, and she was pregnant. And they, uh, <laughs> she got saved, and she was going to be baptized. And they said, I make a motion weeks after a candidate of baptism, and after uh, baptism, full rights and fellowship of the church. And then uh, you're pregnant. Where's your boyfriend? And the boyfriend was a member of the church. What do you got to say, boy? <laughs> now, what do you got to say? Well, that happens, you know. Uh, that's the little churches. Little churches where they meet and do everything, and none of the, nothing that they did was unscriptural. And they did it in a very polite way, but it was very forthcoming and they took care of the problem it was done it was done right not without humiliating them they didn't say how many times did you do this they didn't do anything like that it just said you made you, you we know that you've committed sin right here now what are you going to do about it the guy got up and apologized and they stood up there and everybody went around and they shook hands with him and welcomed into her as Christian fellowship and him as re reinstated in the church now he and they were going to get married and all this stuff, and this was good. That's what happened. They caught, they cured the problem, and a girl got saved. <clears throat> Anything else? Yeah, well, I, I know of a case where a, a young woman, she, she grew up in a church, and she was engaged to be married, and she wanted to get married in the church, but and she was pregnant, and they refused to marry her. I mean, they didn't want to you know, talk about it and, re, and say, okay, Seems like this, but you jump the gun a little bit here and let's get this straight. I mean, they didn't. I mean, he, this guy had been her pastor her whole life, and he refused to marry her. Yeah. I mean, like, the, where's grace? There's a <laughs> there is a lot of abuse in churches. A lot of abuse. People abuse their privileges. A church, real churches, do have the the responsibility to discipline the church members, but not with viciousness, not by being mean. I remember one man that became an agnostic. He was going to a church, and he might have been saved, except he went back to one of these churches, and they got this young girl up there that got pregnant. I mean, they raked her over the coals. They kicked her out of the church and told her not to come back. And she was sorry. They said, get out and don't come back. Don't come back here pregnant. You know? Don't come back here until you're married to somebody. Don't come back. And then she was just bawling and squalling and everything. A guy walked out of the church and he wouldn't have anything else to do with that church ever again. That stopped people from getting saved. You know, a church discipline ought to encourage people to get saved, not to run them off. Okay? All right. Because that's not, I mean, so, so when that's handled, that's handled in private. It's not handled in front of the congregation. It's handled yeah. in private. It, it's a private thing to begin with. Yeah, then, when it, 
and in a church, it's private to be always private to begin with. You don't start bringing charges against somebody in church, but some of these churches do because they like to do this. They're they're wielding authority they don't have. Well, they have the authority, but they're doing it in a malicious way. They're sinning doing what they're doing. First of all, you're supposed to. They're supposed to the uh, to somebody that witnessed it. Supposed to go witness to them and say, "Hey, you know, I know you did this. Do you want to straighten out? What are you going to do?" It said, "Admonish them. If they don't believe, if they won't repent, then take somebody with you. If they won't believe, if they won't listen to these church members, then take it to the church. It doesn't go before the church to begin with. Yeah, so it's, a it's a private thing. It's a private thing. All right, to begin with, and then it goes. But people love authority, don't they?" There are so many people that, that can't handle authority. They cannot handle authority. Uh, my, my wife, I remember an old man, she, she, her father was president of, vice president of Mobile Oil Company. He hired this guy, and he was a horrible foreman. He was a, a good worker. He was such a good worker that they hired him to be a foreman, but he became a belligerent mule skinner on those men. And they hated him. They thinking about getting somebody to kill him. They wanted him fired. He couldn't handle authority. Some churches can't handle authority. They need to repent themselves and straighten out. Simple as that. Truth is truth. Sometimes truth hurts and whatever. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Sharon, would you mind leading us in prayer, please? Dismiss us in prayer. Father, we just uh, thank you for another opportunity to learn